Hello and welcome to The Wild Side. You are listening to your host, Caitlin Kite, and that was Amy Mann singing Lost in Space. And today we are in fact going to be talking about space, and in fact this is going to be the first of a three-part series on our solar system. And this is um, a topic that I'm interested in because I've always had quite a fondness for astronomy, and I used to think I might be an astronomer, but that was before I found out that the study of stars in space involved a lot more than just standing and looking through a telescope and memorizing the names of the constellations. Uh, so sadly that was sidelined, but I, it is something that I like to read about and I like to go out and look at the stars whenever I get the chance when I'm away from bright lights. And actually uh, it's quite an expansive topic, of course. Our solar system is just a little tiny portion of all the astronomical things you can study, but it's still quite a um, quite a lot of information that I can discuss, and that's perfect because I'm about to go to Kenya for two weeks with the University of Exeter Field Course, and so I'm going to pre-record two episodes after this one, so you'll have three full weeks of information about our solar system. And today I'm going to start off with a bit of an introduction about the solar system in general and some of the uh, interesting and unusual bodies that are found within it, and then over the next couple of weeks, I will work through both the inner and the outer solar system and go through the planets uh, that are found in those areas and the interesting things about those planets. So first of all, just an introduction to the solar system that we live in. Well, it was formed about 4.6 billion years ago, and that happened after a giant molecular cloud, which is also sometimes called a stellar nursery, collapsed. And uh, the collapse of this structure called um, permitted density and certain size restrictions that allowed molecules to form. And in particular, it allowed the formation of molecular hydrogen, which is found uh, in a, a duo of, of two hydrogens together. And this was what is really important for the creation of our sun and all the planets that orbit it and all the other bodies that are found in the area. So the, the solar system contains not just the sun, but eight planets. It used to be nine, and of course before that it used to be several fewer because it took a lot of nice equipment to be developed before we could see everything. But of course Pluto has been demoted, so now we have eight planets. We have three or more dwarf planets, including Pluto, and we have 130 planetary satellites, so things like what we would call moons basically, and then many smaller bodies, so things like comets and asteroids, and also the interplanetary media that exists between them. So just to go over each of those terms, Specifically, I know it sounds kind of silly, but you know, what is a planet? Well, it's a large body that orbits the sun, and that's a pretty generic description, but that's about um, the, the kind of, I don't know, the level on which they classify things, because there are lots of, of things that differ from one planet to the next, but basically, once you've reached a certain size, as long as you're above that and you orbit the sun, you can be considered a planet. A satellite, on the other hand, uh, also known as a moon, is something that can be any size, and it's just something that regularly orbits a planet. Asteroids are small, dense, rocky objects that orbit the sun, although interestingly there are also some asteroids that have some uh, kind of complex relationships with, for instance, our Earth, and those kind of act a little bit like moons, and I'll, I'll discuss that a bit more next week. And so it can be hard to kind of distinguish between all of these things all the time. And a comet is a small icy object with highly eccentric orbits, uh, and it can come and go from the inner parts of the solar system and have random orientations relative to other bodies that orbit the sun. So there are things like Halley's Comet, which we can predict with great regularity, and then there are other things that are um, potentially they have absolutely no regular orbit at all, or it might be so irregular or, or regular over such a long time span that we just don't know about it yet because we haven't been able to track it for long enough. Now, as I said earlier, all these classifications can be argued about. There are some moons that are larger than our very smallest planets. So, for example, there are some moons that are bigger than Mercury and Pluto. Um, of course, Pluto now demoted. There are also many small moons that have uh, potentially began as asteroids and then were captured, and so they went from kind of one phase to another. There are lots of comets also that can kind of fizzle out and ultimately end up looking and behaving much like asteroids. And there are objects from the Viper Belt, uh, sorry, the Kuiper Belt, which I'll talk a little bit about again later today, um, and that's located at the far reaches of the solar system. And these things can't be easily classified at all. They're kind of um, asteroid-like, or they're kind of comet-like, or they're kind of like nothing at all. And so what do we call these things? 
And then there are also some complex systems that might act as double planets. So the Earth and the Moon, we think of this as a planet and a satellite, but in some respects, actually, these two bodies function much like um, two planets that are working together. And the same was true of Pluto and Charon before Pluto was uh, decided that it was a dwarf planet instead. And all of these things can also be classified not, ju not just based on size and how they move, but also on their chemical composition, uh, their position relative to the sun, their position relative to the earth, and also just their history, so how and when they were created or how and when we found out about them. Now the last thing that I mentioned earlier and haven't really discussed in more detail is the interplanetary medium. And this is something that we often forget about because we're focused on the, these bodies that we can see through a telescope and not all that empty space in between them. But in fact, there is a ton of interplanetary medium, also known as interplanetary space. And this is kind of an interesting thing because a lot of people seem to think that space is a perfect vacuum, but in fact, that's not the case. It contains lots of other things, including electromagnetic radiation, uh, primarily in the form of photons, plasma, uh, which is electrons and protons and other ions that are ejected by solar winds. Also, there's microscopic dust particles and magnetic fields, again, mostly from the sun. And the contents of the interplanetary medium are really sparsely distributed. And the sparseness increases with increasing distance from the sun. And actually, the, the temperature of this space in between things is incredibly warm. So it's about 100,000 Kelvin. And it, this area extends all the way to the edge of the solar system, where it meets interstellar space and forms what's called a heliosphere. And basically, this kind of acts like a larger version of our atmosphere. So what happens is you've got magnetic particles from the solar winds that flow all the way from the sun, and they interact with interstellar space and form this protective sphere that kind of is like a magnetic bubble around our solar system. And it um, kind of basically in in incorporates us the way that our atmosphere incorporates the Earth and maybe kind of keeps out certain things and keeps other things in because it does have this magnetic relationship with those objects. Now, interplanetary space interacts differently with different planets and bodies depending on the magnetic fields that they may or may not have. And, and different planets do have different degrees of magnetic fields. Some have none at all, and some have very strong ones. Uh, and the interaction, this sort of interaction, is why we can see things like auroras uh, in, in the night sky. Now, the solar system can be broken down into the inner outer portions, which I alluded to earlier. And these are separated by the main asteroid belt, which is found between Mars and Jupiter. So the inner solar system contains the Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and then Mars. And then you've got that asteroid belt, which itself is broken into different bits, which I'll talk a little bit about later. And then you've got the outer solar system, which contains Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and then Pluto. And then beyond that, the Kuiper belt. So all of these planets have elliptical orbits around the Sun, and most of them are more or less circular, though as, as I'll go through each of the planets, you'll find out that some of them are a bit more irregular and oval-shaped, and others are much more circular. Most of the orbits are also more or less in the same plane, and this is called the ecliptic, and that's relative to the, same, the, the plane of the Earth's orbit. So most of the planets kind of move around the Sun in the same basic uh, orientation and area that the Earth does as well. And all the planets also orbit in the same direction. So if you are looking down on the sun from above, and looking down on its north pole, all the planets would appear to move counterclockwise. However, although most of the planets also revolve in a counterclockwise fashion, not all of them do. So Venus, Uranus, and the dwarf planet Pluto all revolve in a clockwise fashion, which is also known as retrograde. And as you already know, the sizes of the planets uh, differ incredibly, and this, in fact, is why Pluto was eventually demoted, because it is so tiny relative to the others. And I read this interesting site that said the easiest way to think about the sizes of the different planets is to uh, reduce their size in your mind by a factor of one billion, uh, which is kind of a, a funny thing to suggest that you do in your mind, because it's really hard to even think about what this concept means. But if you do that, then what you end up with is an Earth that's the size of a grape, and then the Moon is located about a foot away from that. And the Sun would have a diameter the size of an average human's height, so about a meter and a half, and it would be located about one city block from the Earth. Jupiter, which uh, is 
of course the, the largest, would be the size of a large grapefruit, and it would be located about five blocks from the sun. Saturn would be about the size of an orange, and that would be five more blocks away. And then 20 and 30 blocks away from the sun, you've got Uranus and Neptune, which are both approximately lemon-sized. And on this scale, you've got humans coming in at the size of atoms, and the nearest star would be 40,000 kilometers away. And I know that all of that, uh, even though it is simplified from the astronomical scale, it is still really hard to kind of think about what that means. But it is pretty impressive to think that humans are the size of atoms in this scheme, and the Earth is the size of the grapes. That just gives you kind of an idea of how absolutely minuscule we are relative to these other bodies that are around us in the solar system. And that was Cat Power singing Sun. And in fact, the sun is what I am talking about next. And it is the first on my list because it is arguably the most important object in our solar system. And I know you might want to say that perhaps the Earth is the most important since that's what we live on. But the truth is that we wouldn't find Earth very comfortable if we didn't have the sun there. In fact, we, we might not even find Earth here at all because the sun uh, is, of course, what it orbits around. So the sun is one of only... Um, 100 billion stars or so, or I should say the Sun is only one of 100 billion stars or so in our galaxy. And it is classified as what's called a G2 star. And G2 is something that indicates um, where the Sun lo is located on a scale of hottest to coolest. So the scale goes O, B, A, F, G, K, and M, where O is the hottest and M is the coolest. So the sun is kind of in the middle, but a little bit on the cool side relative to some of the other planets that are out there. And it is the largest object in our solar system and contains just under 100% of the entire system's mass. So the sun really is quite a phenomenal thing. So only about 0.2% of the mass of the solar system exists outside of the sun. And it's also... And this is not just something that's quite large for our solar system, but it, in fact is very large in terms of all the other known heavy stars that we are aware of. So if you look at all the other stars that we've looked at and measured, it's still within the top 10% of all of these things in terms of mass. And it's made of predominantly hydrogen, about 70% hydrogen, but also about 28% helium and 2% everything else. But this uh, exact recipe is changing over time because the sun has all of this hydrogen that it's constantly converting to helium through uh, the process of nuclear fusion, which I think I talked a little bit about when I was talking about sustainable energy. So every second, about 700 million tons of hydrogen are converted into approximately 695 million tons of helium and then another 5 million tons of energy, and this energy is in the form of gamma rays. And this happens in the core of the sun, and that energy, that heat, is being moved outwards from the core up to the surface of the sun and then eventually out into space where it eventually will reach us. And as it moves from the center of the sun outward, it's continuously, that energy is continuously absorbed and then re-emitted at lower and lower temperatures as it travels from the core outwards to the surface. And so by the time it exits the sun, it's primarily just found in the form of visible light which, of course, is what our plants can take advantage of when they're doing photosynthesis. Now, the sun is about 4.57 billion years old, and over its lifespan it has already used up about half of the hydrogen in its core. So if you think about the age of it uh, and the speed with which it's going through its hydrogen stores, you can see that it does, in fact, have quite a lot of life left in it. So, in fact, researchers think that it will continue to do what it does now, which they refer to sometimes as a peaceful radiation, for about another five billion years or so. And it, over that time, it will even begin to increase in luminosity, so it will become even brighter. But runs, once it runs out of hydrogen, it will undergo some changes that will eventually destroy the Earth and will probably end up creating a planetary nebula. And basically what, ha what will happen to really boil it down in its very simplest form is that the sun will throw out all the gases that currently make it up, and this will create a shell that will probably be about um, one light year across or less, and that's what a planetary nebula is. And when it, creates, when it throws out all of those gases, that is what's going to rip through the solar system and destroy all the things around it. Now the sun is multi-layered, which you probably have already kind of gleaned from the way I was talking about 
where the fusion reaction occurred and how the, the gamma rays move outwards from that. And the different bits of the sun actually rotate at different speeds. And if you're looking at the equator, you'll find that it's rotating about every uh, once every 25 and a half days or so. But then if you go up to the poles, it might take as long as once every 36 days. And this variation in rotation is true all the way down into the interior of the sun. But at the very core, uh, which is made up, which basically accounts for about 25% of the radius of the sun, you'll find that it's moving as a solid body. It's not ripped apart into these different bits that rotate separately. And in the core, you'll find that the temperature is extremely hot. So again, we're kind of talking about measurements that are just outside of the scope of the human imagination. But just for the sake of sounding really impressive, I'll tell you that it's 15 and a half million Kelvin or so. And it's also incredibly high pressure, so about 250 billion atmospheres. And the density of the sun is actually over 150 times that of water. So taking all these things together, to, to put it briefly, the sun is a really extreme environment and very uncomfortable. And the surface of the sun is known as the photosphere, and it's approximately 5,800 Kelvin. And you'll probably have heard about sunspots, which are these things that are not very well understood, um, that you can sometimes see in images of the sun. You'll see these dark spots. And the reason that they show up as these dark spots is that they are a bit cooler. So they're about 2,000 Kelvin less, or about 3,800 degrees Kelvin. And they can actually be really large. Some of the largest are up to 50,000 kilometers in diameter. And these are really very much of interest to researchers because they um, appear to react, uh, they appear to happen as a result of kind of magnetic interactions, and they can have an effect on what the sun is doing and how that interacts with our own weather and temperature patterns, though not a whole lot is known about this. And so people are trying to understand this more, along with solar flares, which I'll talk about here in a second. And actually there have been some things deployed recently to study these things in more detail over the next several years. Now the sun also has a small area above the photosphere, and that's called the chromosphere, and outside of that is where you'll find the corona. And you'll all probably have seen pictures of the corona, probably from an eclipse that happened at some point or another. And the eclipse extends millions of kilometers out into space, but can only be seen during a total solar eclipse. So that's why you have those, um, those great images where you can see the, dark, the darkness of, uh, across the sun, but then these amazing coronas radiating out around that. And the corona itself is also incredibly hot, so it's over a million Kelvin. And it's quite interesting to think about uh, the fact that the corona is actually hotter than the surface of the sun itself. And although we mostly think of the sun as being something that gives us heat and light, it does also release solar wind, which I referred to a bit earlier when I was talking about all the stuff that we can find in interplanetary space. And solar wind is a low-density stream of charged particles, so mostly electrons and protons. And this solar wind can move through the system at incredibly high speeds, so about 450 kilometers per second. And both these particles and other particles that are ejected by solar flares can have huge impacts on our planet. So we experience things like radio interference and power line surges and auroras and all these um, interesting, unusual, and sometimes obnoxious things. But it can also have impacts on other bodies as well. So it can change the way that comet tails uh, appear to us and uh, how, how big they are and how bright they are. It can also alter spacecraft uh, trajectories and it can impact the, the things that we put up into space, whether that is satellites or um, the, the space station or other spacecraft that are up there. And the flow of solar wind does tend to vary over time and also space. And as I said, this is one of the things that is going to be investigated by the spacecraft that have been deployed to study solar winds over a longer period of time. And actually, I, when I was in DC a couple of years ago, I went to an IMAX theater and had the chance to watch an IMAX movie about this. And it was really amazing because they had taken some of the original, uh, the first images that were sent home by these spacecraft as they set out to explore the sun. And all of these were rendered on a huge screen and in 3D. And so you could see these amazing views of the sun and of these magnificent sunspots and these huge solar flares and the corona. And it's just absolutely impressive. And um, in fact, this process is really interesting to us as well, all these things that the sun does, because 
the solar wind and the heat and the light, they can vary over time. And when they do vary, they may impact the weather patterns that we have, though it's not entirely clear whether, uh, whether this is the case or how it's the case exactly. So for example, in the 17th century, there was a period of low um, solar wind activity that was known as the Maunder Minimum. And this corresponded with something that it has come to be known as the Little Ice Age. And researchers still aren't clear whether this is a coincidence or whether there is a, a causal reaction here. And it's quite interesting because you would think, well, of course, if something happens with the sun uh, where it's less active, that would make sense for it to uh, you know, affect our weather in some way. But actually, it, it could just happen to be uh, something that, you know, the coinc there are many coincidences in our solar system, which I'll kind of outline in the next couple of weeks. And this could be one of them, but it also could indicate that these little things that happen on the sun in addition to this major uh, fusion event that happens that gives us all the heat and energy that we have, all of these things together could contribute to give us the weather patterns and the co uh, conditions that we experience on a daily basis. And that was Paul Simon singing St. Judy's Comet, an oldie but a goodie. And comets are the next one up on my list, the next astronomical body to discuss. And these have been recognized by humans for a very long time, which is probably not surprising to you because they are a pretty obvious feature of the night sky whenever they are around. Uh, for example, the, uh, the Chinese recorded Halley's Comet as far back as 240 BCE, and the Bayou Tapestry, which shows the Norman Conquest of 1066, also shows the comet. Um, so that's several hundred, in fact, a couple thousand years ago. And there are uh, over 4,500 known comets in our solar system so far, but there, are, there could be more than that that we just haven't seen yet. Some, if not all of these, are periodic, and others have uh, very erratic and irregular orbits, and as I said, may be actually more periodic than we currently realize, but we need a bit more time to find that out because we just haven't had the chance to observe them for long enough. And comets are sometimes also known as dirty snowballs or icy mud balls, if you want to be kind of poetic about it. And in fact, this reflects the fact that they are a mixture of ices, so ices from water and also frozen gas, that were not incorporated into planets when the solar system was formed. So in a sense, these do represent a very uh, ancient and kind of pristine bit of what, composition from our solar system. And they become quite active near the sun, and they are visible particularly at sunrise or sunset, when they are uh, brightest because of their proximity to the sun. And only at this point are we actually able to see them and recognize their anatomy. So they have a nucleus, which is a solid and very stable core of ice, gas, dust, and solids all frozen together. Then they have something called a coma, which is a dense cloud of water and carbon dioxide and other neutral, ga uh, neutral gases that have been sublimed from the nucleus, so that means that they have gone straight from a solid into a gas as the little bits have come off of the nucleus and been captured by the coma. There's also another cloud called the hydrogen cloud, and this is enormous, but it's quite sparse, and it's, called, it's also called an envelope of neutral hydrogen, and this can be millions of kilometers in diameter. So this, is, uh, this makes up quite a bit of, of what it is that we can see whenever this thing starts to become uh, more visible next to the sun. But predominantly what we see is the dust and the ion tail. And the dust tail is composed of smoke-sized dust particles that are driven off the nucleus as gases escape from it and explode the particles outward. And this can be up to 10 million kilometers long. And when you don't have a telescope and you look up and see a comet, this is mostly what you're looking at. The ion tail is composed of plasma and also rays and streamers that are caused by interactions between the comet and the solar wind. And this also can be several hundred million kilometers long. So comets are um, actually very massive structures depending on which bit of them you're measuring, whether it's the nucleus or this whole thing that encompasses also the ion tail. And it's kind of hard to get a sense of that whenever we're looking at them from way down here because they do look like maybe they're the size of just a meteor or even a planet up in the sky. But in fact, these things are incredibly, incredibly long. And most of the comets have what's known as an eccentric orbit. And this takes them to far reaches of the solar system, and then they can disappear for millennia at a time before eventually working their way back in. And for the most part, once a comet passes near the sun about 500 or so times, 
it loses all of its ice and its gas because as it passes, it, uh, it reacts with the sun because of the heat and the other particles that are being emitted by the sun, and that causes the comet to lose all of these bits of itself. And ultimately what's left is a rocky object that looks very much like an asteroid. And in fact, many of the things that we currently think are asteroids may actually be uh, comets that are dead, for lack of a better word. And when a comet strays too near the sun, it might impact a planet because its, its orbit will be disrupted. It might actually crash into the sun. Or in fact, it can have such a disruption of its orbit that it's flung out of the solar system, never to return. And interestingly, we do occasionally have uh, the Earth passing through a comet's orbit, and that's when we experience these amazing meteor showers where we get all the little bits uh, that are coming out of the dust tail and interacting with our atmosphere. So an example of this includes the Perseid meteor shower, which happens every year uh, in early August, so about the 9th to the 13th, and also the Orionid shower, which occurs in October. Now, I've already mentioned asteroids a, a few times, so they're a logical next thing on the list. And these were first noted actually fairly recently in terms of kind of astronomical history. So not until 1801 were they first viewed and recognized as a thing separate from other stuff that we've kind of seen up in space before. But since that time, uh, astronomers and amateurs have really made up for lost time because they have now found several hundred thousand other asteroids that are uh, that have been seen and then also named, and there are thousands more that are discovered each year because there are just so many of these things hanging around in space that it's just a matter you know, of, of staying and looking at your telescope long enough and crossing off all the ones that you know before you can then find ones that you haven't seen before or ones that maybe were hidden behind another one. Amazingly though, despite the fact that there are so many of these things in our solar system, their total mass together amounts to less than half that of the moon. So actually they're, they're quite light even though they are made of, of rock and metal. And the densities of them are not really well known, but at least one measured comet, uh, Matilda, had a density similar to water. And this indicates that they're not solid, but instead that they are a, a pile of debris that's kind of come together and become compacted. So there are probably lots of empty spaces in the midst of the larger asteroid. And as I said earlier, they are rocky and often metallic, and they can be classified according to their chemical composition, so exactly what it is that they're made up of, which, which uh, atoms are involved, and also how much they reflect. So the C-type, and this is the most common, it makes up about 75% or more of all known asteroids. Uh, these guys are very dark, and they're quite similar to carbonaceous chondrite meteorites, and I know that probably does not mean much to many people. Certainly it doesn't mean that much to me. But basically this indicates that they have lots of water, organic compounds, uh, things like silicates and oxides and sulfides, and also the minerals olivine and serpentine. And the next type is the S-type, and these are the next most common, about 17% of all known asteroids. And these guys are relatively brighter, and they are made of metallic nickel and iron mixed with iron and magnesium silicates. So as you might expect, the more metal they have, kind of the more reflective they are. The N-type are the very bright ones, and these are pure nickel and iron. And then you've got other rarer types, and there are about a dozen or so of these uh, that just can't be classified with any other, any other things. They're all kind of unique. But you can also categorize asteroids based on their position in the solar system. So some of these are located in the main belt, which is between Mars and Jupiter, as I mentioned earlier, and that's what separates the inner and outer portions of the solar system. And within uh, that area, they can also be subdivided again. And there are several different groups, several different bands of asteroids, and each of these bands is named after the main asteroid, the largest asteroid in that cluster. And between each of these groups, you'll find more empty regions that are known as Kirkwood Gaps. However, we also do have near-Earth asteroids, and these closely approach the Earth. And I'll talk a little bit about those um, next week when I talk about Earth and kind of the, the satellites, or almost satellites, like these asteroids that the Earth has. There are also a type of asteroid known as Trojans, and these are located near Jupiter's Lagrange points. And Lagrange points are this kind of a difficult concept to, well, to understand, but also to explain. And I only know it in kind of the most basic way. But basically, uh, these are apexes of an equilateral triangle 
that shows a stable arrangement of three bodies within a single plane. So basically you've got Jupiter and then you've got two other points that form a triangle with it and at those two other points that's where you have um, these asteroids. And because of where all of them are positioned and because of the density, the, the relative densities of these different things, you find that all three of them, um, the, the two asteroids or groups of asteroids and the planet itself, they can all kind of coexist together in this stable formation of a triangle within that plane. And so here Jupiter has pulled in and, and held these asteroids near it. And another group of asteroids can be found out in the outer solar system and these guys are known as centaurs. And there may be more asteroids as well, but they are probably subject to perturbation quite a lot because they aren't that dense most likely, and there are lots of things out there that they can interact with, including uh, planets, each other, um, comets, debris in the solar system, all sorts of stuff. And also, it's kind of hard to look at these things and figure out how to classify them, as I mentioned earlier, because a lot of them have, uh, these centaurs, they can have composition that's very similar to comets and other objects out in the Kuiper Belt. And so maybe they aren't actually asteroids, but they're just kind of asteroid-like. And there is this whole range of things out in the far reaches of our solar system that we just don't understand that well because we don't yet have the technology to really look at it in very strong detail. Now asteroids, in case you're interested in going out and seeing them, unfortunately they are not visible with the naked eye. But they can be seen if you happen to have a small telescope, or if it's a big enough asteroid or it's close enough to the Earth, you can also sometimes see them with binoculars. So. That was Michael Bublé singing Stardust. And the last objects, or I guess more like places, that are on my list of today's kind of odd and unusual bits of the solar system are the Kuiper Belt and also the Oort Cloud. And together these things um, are sometimes also known as trans-Neptunian objects. So the Kuiper Belt is a disk-shaped region that is located past Neptune, and it contains lots of small icy bodies. And when I say lots, I mean probably more than 100,000 or so. But as I mentioned earlier, some of this is kind of um, sketchy territory because a lot of these things are kind of theorized and we have little glimpses but not very high resolution images or information about this whole area of our solar system. So the Kuiper Belt is kind of similar to but much larger and more massive than the asteroid belt. And all the little bodies that it contains are kind of rocky and metallic, but some of them are also frozen volatiles like methane and ammonia and water. And it may be the source of some of the short period comets that we have uh, kind of moving through our solar system. So the orbit of an object in the Kuiper Belt will be disturbed by interactions between the larger planets, and this causes the object to cross Neptune's orbit, and that then changes the path of that object so that it will go out of the solar system, crash into a neighboring planet, or alter its course so that it goes into the interior of the solar system where we will view it uh, as it moves through the sky. And these bodies are originating from something, a, a region of the, the Kuiper Belt known as the scattered disk. And this overlaps with the bit of the Kuiper Belt but is created, or was created I should say, by Neptune's movement some four and a half billion years or so ago when, um, when the solar system was being created. And some people will write about this the scattered disk as being a separate thing from the Kuiper Belt and others will say that it's actually a portion of the Kuiper Belt. Um, and certainly it is kind of hard to really distinguish between them because there is this overlapping section uh, where these two different things or bits of the same thing are found in the very same place. And the Oort cloud is something else that's kind of lumped in together with uh, the Kuiper Belt because it is found out in the same place and is um, also kind of similarly unknown and mysterious in many ways. So it was first hypothesized in 1950 and by Jan um, Van Oort, and it was, or sorry, Jan Oort, and it was proposed as this kind of spherical cloud of comets that might lie about one light year or so from the sun. And basically, what happened was that Jan was looking out into space and he found that no comets ever seemed to emerge from interstellar space. They all seemed to come from within our solar system. 
He also noticed that there were these long period comets that share uh, similar aphelias, which are the furthest distance that they ever are found from the Sun. And in all cases, these were maxing out at about 50,000 astronomical units, or one light year. And he also found that comets did not seem to have any kind of preferential direction of approach. So it didn't seem like there was just this one spot that they were all coming from and then going to in the same direction, but in fact it was quite random. And so what he thought to kind of explain all of these things at the same time was that there might be this cloud out in the outer reaches of our solar system that was composed of matter that had formed originally quite close to the sun whenever our solar system was formed, and then it was scattered out into space and then wound up at the far reaches of the solar system. Not quite, not quite so far that it left the solar system, it was still held in place by kind of the gravitational pull of the planets and the sun, but about as far out as you can go without going into interstellar space. And what's interesting is that when the sun was formed in the nebula that I mentioned very, at the very beginning of, um, of the show, in that, uh, that nursery, that stellar nursery, it would have been formed with sister planets, and these would have gradually kind of moved apart and interacted with each other. And so they would have kind of given and taken various bits and pieces as they moved apart from each other, or in some cases they maybe kind of periodically moved close to each other as they were moving out into space. And as they did this, all these things were floating around in between them and being affected by them. And those are all the little bits that eventually would have wound up in this Oort cloud. So these things that originated quite close to the sun and were kind of flung about by all the planets and then ended up somehow kind of scattered and dragged out to the outer recesses of our solar system. And uh, despite the fact that the Oort body, uh, the, sorry, the Oort cloud may contain trillions of comets and may in fact make up a significant portion of the solar system's mass because of all the stuff that it contains, the sizes of the comets, they're very small, and also their extreme distances from us make it quite difficult for researchers to collect any direct evidence about this. And so even though there is quite a lot of uh, mathematical and theoretical evidence that, in fact, this cloud is out there, it is still quite a speculative thing, and researchers are still trying to figure out more about what's happening out there and where all these comets come from and what their interactions are with each other and the things around them. Um, but it's quite an interesting thing, both of these, because the, the Kuiper Belt and the Oort Cloud both are considered to be very pristine remnants, just like the comets and the asteroids, but particularly the comets that I mentioned earlier. They are these pristine remnants of the young solar system. So they, they came out of that, the inter, that stellar nursery that I was talking about, and um, they, you know, they were there at the same time that our sun was being born, and they just weren't incorporated into these bodies, these planets and the other stars that, that happened in that molecular cloud. And so they actually are the very same building blocks of the other stuff that we see, but they're just still kind of more in building block formation. And so if we are able to see these and find out more about them, then it would be really helpful for us as we try to create models in order to understand how the solar system formed, and maybe how it evolved over time. And with that, I'm going to wrap up for the day. So I've covered all the kind of interesting and unusual bits of our solar system. And next week, I'm going to go over the inner solar system. So the, the first four planets and our moon as well, because it would be remiss to ignore our lovely satellite. And then the week after that, I'm going to be talking about the outer solar system as well. And I apologize for any mistakes I have made in this show or will make in the next two because I admit I am not an astronomer and I have had to read all about this stuff and trust in other people's uh, hard research. But I do find it all quite interesting and I would love to have you write in or uh, post a note or give me a phone call or whatever if you have some corrections to make. And if you have some good corrections, I will definitely make them on air or I will put them on the website so that no one will be led astray by anything that I have said on the show. So with that, I will end up today by playing a little bit of Blitz and Trapper singing Astronaut.